grew up in a small town in Nova Scotia. And I was a bit of an awkward and inward child. I was bullied, often by boys, and I didn't really know why. I guess I was different, maybe different from other girls, but I never knew why. But my safe space was in books. I absolutely loved reading. I would check 10 books out of the library every week, read them all, bring them back, and get 10 more. And what I really loved was a series, because I would get to know the characters, and they would become my friends. And one of my favorite series was Encyclopedia Brown. And I can remember rushing to the library and getting every one that they had in stock, and then reading them and waiting for the next. And then I discovered the Hardy Boys, and Trixie Belden, and Bobsy Twins, and Nancy Drew, and I got transported to other worlds. And what I would dream is being the sidekick. I always wanted to be the one that was learning from the main characters. They were so wise and talented. They knew what they were doing, and I would be learning from them, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, I would come up with a clue and they would acknowledge and validate me. And you know, as I was preparing for this and thinking about those times, I hadn't thought about this in years, and I started looking at my career, and something started to niggle at me. And I realized that, in fact, my entire career, I always was the second person behind the leader. And it was interesting because I would come in with lots of big ideas and wanting so badly to contribute and doing the work and providing lots of good support. And I really believed that we were working together on the projects and the businesses that we were creating. And I believed that at some point I would be acknowledged, I would be validated for the work that I was doing. It often didn't happen. Because you see, what happens when we're working like that is for me, I was always looking at the leader and saying, what is it about that leader that makes them a leader? And I didn't have the intuitive sense of what it took to be a leader. And so I would do something called social camouflaging. I would start to mimic the behavior of the leaders that I was working with. And I thought, well, if they're doing it, and if I do that same thing, if I think in that same way, if I show up in that way, then I'm a leader. But the reality was, it's not authentic. And because it's not authentic, it never really worked for me. And so, you know, I continued on in my career. And about eight years ago, I made the decision to open Talk Boutique. And I did, made that decision along with a business partner. And there I was, number two again. You see, my business partner loved being center stage, literally being center stage. And I thought, well, this is great, because I can be backstage, right? I can do all the things that are necessary. And that worked for a while, until I started to understand that I needed to be center stage sometimes, maybe not all the times, but sometimes. And the more that I wanted to be center stage, interestingly, my clients wanted me to be center stage too. And they were asking for me to do that. And my partner didn't believe that that was the case. And so it created a bit of a rift between us. And that partnership became untenable. And so I started negotiating to end that partnership. And on March 8, 2020, we signed the dissolution papers for that partnership. And then, on March 11th, three days later, COVID-19 happened. My business was built on live events, public speaking. You can imagine what happened. But actually, 
What was more interesting? You see, when you step into a leadership role, and that's what I was doing for the very first time, I was taking my own tentative steps into leadership. And suddenly, I had to negotiate a, pan a global pandemic. It was like, it was like, universe, what the hell? I mean, for God's sake, give me a break, right? Well, the next 18 months were very difficult. And I was reevaluating everything in my life, from my life to my career to my business to the people that worked with and for me. And around about that time, my daughter came to me. Now, this is my daughter, Madison. She's actually right over there. Um, and she came to me and she said, Mom, you know what? I think I'm going to go get tested for ADHD. And I was like, oh, wow. I had never thought of that. Um, OK. And what she said next really rocked my world. Because what she said to me is she said, you know it's genetic. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I had no idea. And so I thought for a moment. I went, oh, you know what? That makes perfect sense. It's probably your father. <laughs> And she shook her head and she looked at me and she said, Mom, no, it is not Dad. It is absolutely you and I think you should go and get tested. Well, I actually didn't think a whole lot about it. But the next time I was at my doctor, I showed up. I said to her, you know, my daughter had this conversation with me and, um, and my doctor was like, well, it is genetic and I'm actually trained in doing the diagnostics. So if you're interested, we can do the tests. So I was like, sure, what do I have to lose? Let's, let's go for it. Now, let me just point out, at this point in my life, I'm 56 years old. I'm like, what's it going to change, right? So when the diagnostic came back, not only was I ADHD, I was like textbook ADHD, and I was also likely high-functioning autistic. I was like, holy cow, that was a game changer. And I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. I am 56 years old at this point. I'm a woman. I am navigating the effects of a global pandemic, and now I'm neurodivergent? <laughs> Come on, cut me a break. But that diagnostic, that diagnosis was a gift because it had me understanding my life in a whole new way. You see, what I started to understand was that my brain works differently. And when I look back on my career and on all of those times when I was trying to emulate a leader or trying to fit in, I started to understand that I didn't have the capacity to understand those situations. It was not that I, there was anything wrong with me. It was that my brain worked differently. But there was another real benefit to being neurodivergent. You see, what my brain does incredibly well is it finds patterns. And I can see patterns all around me. And when I started looking at my career, I could see a pattern that was helping me that I didn't even understand. And that pattern was that my entire career had been focused on helping others to see themselves and the work they were doing in a new light. And by doing that, I was helping to create an outcome that was helping others. And I could see my own impact. The work I was doing, of course, at that point in time, as a speaker's coach, and I was working with scientists and academics and technologists and people who are incredibly powerfully smart and influential in our world. And what I was seeing was the pattern of how I, my thinking, was helping them to understand their thinking, which was helping to create a different world. I was like, wow, that is powerful. And I went from never wanting to be center stage because I didn't think I had anything to say. I didn't think I had anything to share. And suddenly, I started to understand that I had a lot to share, that I had a gift that I needed to share because what I started to understand 
was that we need a breadth and a diversity of thought leaders in this world. Because when we have that, we create a more resilient future. Why? Because when we share and we value the diversity of each of our thinking, what we're doing is we're creating the opportunity to spark ideas in others. And when we do that, we start to co-create. And co-creation is the, absolutely the focus and the benefit of diversity because diversity creates a strong foundation. And we co-create a future that is based in diversity because of the diverse thought leaders who create it. But here's the thing. We all strive for sameness, right? People want to fit in. They don't want to stand out. They don't want to be different. Why? What is wrong with sameness? What's wrong with diversity? Which one actually helps us? Well, to do that, we got to look at evolutionary psychology. When you look at, go back in time, and I always, I'm a history buff. I love looking at history to be able to understand where we are today. Well, evolutionary psychology would say to us that being different is dangerous. Why? Because we need to be part of our community. Our communities help us. They keep us safe. They protect us. We get, we get um, innovation and resource sharing and protection. Because when we go way back in history, we were being chased by dinosaurs. So being part of the community was really, really important. Because you got left behind. If you were different and they said, hey, you're not part of this community, you could die. That has been written into our genetic code. It is something called epigenetics. We need to fight that because the reality is we're not being chased by dinosaurs anymore. We're safer now than we have ever been. And because of that, we have the luxury of being different. And it is a luxury that we as humans have really never had. But you see, the reality is because this is so written into our genetic code, it is something that my psychologist used to like to say, it was useful once, it helped us survive, but it becomes useless. And we have to recognize when it's useless. And we have to let it go. Because what diversity does is it creates resilience. And how do I know that? Well, when we look to nature, what we know is that the more diverse an ecosystem is, the better it is able to manage and adapt and adopt to change. And so we need a variety of, um, of, of voices in order to be able to manage the rate of change that we are at. And if you don't believe me that we are at a threshold in our history, just look at this. If you look at this curve, this part, from here all the way over to here, 10,000 years, that is human evolution. And then, in the last 300 years, we have, we have evolved more, we have created more, we have learned more, we have done more in 300 years than we did in 10,000 years. And that is a lot of change to manage. And so, sameness is not an option when we are changing like this. We need resilience, we need each other. We need a diversity of thought leadership. You know, if we look at a quick case study, some of you may know this study. In Yellowstone, in the early part of the 19th century, they got rid of wolves. Why? Well, wolves were predators. They were taking down deer and elk, and it was felt that they needed the deer and elk in the park, um, and so they eradicated all wolves. Within 40 years, the park began to die. It was becoming barren. What had happened was without a predator, the elk and the deer 
we're eating all of the leaves on specific trees that were creating shade. Well, that shade was actually protecting smaller plants. And the ability for those plants to thrive was going away, so they were dying. Without those plants, young saplings actually weren't, weren't growing, which meant the beaver population went away. And when the beaver population went away, that meant that there were no more dams. And when there were no more dams, the water system was not flourishing and the rivers began to dry up. You can see one, one voice, the wolves, created all of that change. In 1995, they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone Park and within five years, the park had completely revitalized. What I want you to think about with that example, think of it as one voice amongst many. We need all voices, because when one voice is absent, it throws the entire ecosystem off. So what is your voice? How are you using your voice to help others understand theirs? Because that's what happens. When we use our voice, we inspire others. Because diversity is resilience, and we need more diversity in our thought leadership. I want you to think about who you think of as thought leaders today. They probably don't look like me. They probably don't look like most of us. And the reality is we need them too because they are creating our future. And we are now in a place, a threshold of change. And this is the time for each of us to step up and step in to who we are, what we know, and tell others why we know it. You know, I used to work with, again, on TED, I worked with a speaker by the name of Drew Dudley, and he used to say, don't tell me what you know, tell me why and how you know it. Why and how is way more interesting than what. And as thought leaders, we each are learning our why and our how, and that is how we inspire. It has never been easier to use our voice. And today, we need more and not less voices. I am live every day on social media. I live stream every day. And I don't do that for me, and I don't do it for fame. I do it because my thought leadership, the words that I'm saying, will inspire one person. And that person will inspire one other person. It doesn't matter to me if one person or 200 people listen to those live streams. I will continue to do them because it is creating something bigger than me. And if that's what I'm creating, then that's important. You know, we created the salon to give you fodder for conversation. So how will you impact others? All those many, those few years ago, when I was newly diagnosed as neurodivergent, I went back to doing exactly what it was that I loved to do. I started reading, and I read everything that there was to read about neurodivergence. And I learned a lot about how my brain works and about why I had so many challenges in my career. And I started to forgive myself and I started to understand how I had held myself back because I didn't believe in my voice. And as a neurodivergent aging woman who is now an entrepreneur and trying my best to succeed, I'm trying to inspire others. And the reality is that a diversity of thought leadership is going to create a resilient future. And each of you has a part in that. So think about what context do you have? What stories can you tell? How will you share what you know? You don't have to do it on a world stage. You can do it in your family. You can do it in your neighborhood. But each of you are thought leaders that you may not know you are. So I encourage you all, stand up, speak up, and share your voice. Our collective future is relying on it.